Just five days after the Flesh Will On, won by Laurent Jalaba, has been held the second part of the Ardennes weekend, the Liège Baston Liège, the oldest classic in the world. And this one is a World Cup counting event over 262 kilometres. Hello again, I'm Phil Liggett and I'm joined by my co-commentator Paul Sherwin. Well, there are many, many small climbs on this event. The race so far has stayed basically together, but now it looks as though the new Batic team is trying to launch a series of attacks. This now is Francesco Frattini, who's gone out front. Bitterly cold start to the day, although the sun was nicely and bright in the sky. And now, as we head around the course that goes down to Bastogne, the sting is always on the return back from Bastogne and the famous climb of Laradut, often the stepping stone that takes the man away to victory. But so far, Paul, the race has not been really what we would have expected. It's a standard start to Liège, Baston Liège, an early break went out to gain a little bit of publicity, but then when it comes down to the fruit, to crucial part of the race, the big teams start to control it, keep the speed high. Frattini there, I think, are going off the front there to try and pick their pace up just a little bit because they've got two men in their team who I feel have a good chance this afternoon. Gabriele Colombo who was the winner of Milan San Remo last year and then also Evgeny Berzun who wasn't so bad last uh, Wednesday when he rode in flesh well on so it could be that they're looking for a performance in their team trying to put the pressure on the Onse but Onse as you can see got two men at the front here dedicated to the victory today hopefully of Laurent Jalabert. Well, it's little David Echebarria, the former amateur, amateur champion, he's a sprinter really, of Spain, now settling into his second full season with the Onse team. I actually met him in Australia about two years ago now. We used to go out cycling every morning together, but he doesn't understand any English or French, so we didn't have a long conversation, but he is a very nice young man. Anyway, he's doing his little job as domestique at the front here, hoping that Laurent Jalabert or Alex Zula will finish it off like they did in the Flesh Wallon with first and third places. But in this team, in the race uh, today, we've got Johan Museo coming on board again, the world champion and the World Cup holder. And so I would think he wouldn't appear here if he didn't have some serious intent on trying for the win. Well, interesting, in fact, that Johan Museo did not ride the flesh well on in the middle of the week, preferring to train and try and get a little bit of energy back. And also one man who didn't take part in flesh well on is the white jersey in the middle of the screen there of the World Cup leader. He actually went down to the Tour of the Pay Basque to try and use that as Pacific's preparation for the event here. And Paul there talking about Rolf Sorensen, who had just that great victory in the Tour de Flanders this year. This looks like uh, Andrea Taffy who's coming through. And uh, the field, strange enough, keeping together. The pace itself isn't slow. In fact, on the contrary, they're going along at a very speedy pace here. Uh, but nobody is pushing it to get off the front, uh, which leads to, to me to think, Paul, that there is going to be a lot of infighting once we get back into the hills that bring us back up to Liège. Another attack going here. Again, it looks as if it's one of the Batic Del Monte riders going clear. And it could well be that it's either Colombo or Frattini again trying to hop things up a bit because they have got a very large bunch still together at the moment. And I don't think going into the, the smaller climbs that the riders are going to be too happy with that. Well, the Batic team, their team captain, Evgeny Berzin. But they've also got Kengi Alta and uh, Brignoli and Colombo, Frattini. Mayer and Volpi on the squad, so plenty of cards they can use, but I'm not too sure why they are doing this. They've obviously got a plan of their own, launching attack after attack, and this again, Paul, is Frattini. He's gone once more, having just been brought back, and this looks a little bit more serious this time as he accelerates quite quickly. Well, Frattini won the Grand Prix of Frankfurt two years ago in a solo ride off towards the end, so he's not a man scared of a race uh, parkour like this, it goes up and down throughout the Ardennes countryside, very steep climbs indeed, and if they do give him too much of a leeway, well he might steal the show, but I'm sure that all of this is basically to try and put the pressure on the Onse squad who have to do the work to try and bring Jalabert to the bottom of the Côte de la Redoute in an ideal position to launch an attack and explode the field. He's putting himself here right onto the nose of his saddle. As he tries to get a lead over the field, it always amazes me at the speed these professionals ride, how anybody manages to get off the front of the bunch to start with, and never mind increase the speed to go away from the bunch. 
see Phil on his ear there. There's a little sticking plaster. In fact, so many of the teams now are opting to use a form of radio communication or another to stay in touch on the big occasions with their team managers so they know just exactly what is happening, how the race is developing, and also it's an advantage to know if one of your team leaders has a problem at the back because in a field of almost 200 riders, if you're at the front, sometimes you're unaware of what's happening at the rear. And the sun coming up on the right shoulder of Fatini as he now tries to get away. Here's the field, ever present at the front, the yellow jerseys of Onsay. And also as on Wednesday, there is the jersey of the national champion of Denmark, winner of last year's Tour de France, Bjarne Riso. Looking a little bit more interested in the races this last few days. He's decided now that his form is starting to come to fruition. He has done an awful lot of training so far this year. Cut out a little bit of the early season races. As you've said, he has spent a lot more time training. He's building himself up for his one big rendezvous of this year, and that's going to be the Tour de France, where he hope that he can defend his title. And he's already said he's the favourite, and he said it. And last year, when he said in the November he could win the Tour de France, well, everybody had a little private laugh to themselves, knowing the, the roundabouts and the whereabouts of Miguel Indurain. But as we saw, he did crack at Big Mig, and at the end of the year, Big Mig was the one to retire, and Bjorn Arise was the one to carry off the trophy in the Tour de France, and he says he can do it again. We'll see. That's uh, coming up in July, and of course, we'll give you a full video on that. Well, this race, in fact, uh, going on longer than the Tour de France, which began in 1903. liege Baston liege actually began in 1896. And so we're going to see now who's going to win this edition, which is the 83rd. At the moment, Fratini here in the town of Remuchon and heading down towards the Laraduc climb and trying to steal a march over the rest of the field. And this is a good move, Paul, because he's got the lead. It's going to give Evgeny Berzin and Colombo perhaps an easier ride to Laradut, because really Laradut should be where the race will begin in earnest. It is a very critical point of the race. He hasn't got so much of a lead at the bottom as we go into the town there of Remuchon. You see, the problem with Laradut is there's so much chaos. It's a very narrow road indeed. A lot of supporters turn out there to watch the event. And today, strangely enough, there is already still a big peloton left. And I think Fratini will be back in the main fold before we actually start to climb up the slopes of Laradut. Well, this is a very hard climb. It gets very steep in the middle. There's always a big crowd waiting on it. For a while, after it turns right, it swings up alongside the main auto route going down through Liège, and then it swings away into the fields, and that's where the climb is at its steepest. We don't normally have such a big bunch as this one, though, uh, threading through the narrow streets of Remuchon as it makes its way almost down the back entries here before it climbs up the Laraduc mountain itself. And it looks as though the field now is beginning to really attack this climb and get themselves established at or near the front. They know that the leaders will start to go here because once over the top, the roads stay narrow for quite a long way. Then they drop down to wider roads and then they get onto the climb of the Côte des Forges. And you can see a nice shot down there. The world champion just getting out of the saddle as he moves smoothly to the fore. And Rolf Sorensen dropping one behind him. So the World Cup holder and the World Cup leader one on one. But there's a little bit of a gap gone there, Paul. Now, once through that bridge, they make a right here. And this is where the climb really begins. And where, where Paul Sherwin used to lose a bit of ground, right? I never actually finished Liège, Bastogne, Liège. Phil, I used to ride Liège to Bastogne and then get off in the team car because I'd done my work for the day. Because this is a very tough second half of the race. And the work being done here by MG Technogym, obviously trying to set something up for either Michele Bartoli or Michele Coppolillo. But it's good to see Johan Museo up here. He's never really liked Liège, Bastogne, Liège. He's preferred to spend more of his energy on Paris-Roubaix and the Tour of Flanders. But here he's comfortably sitting in fourth position. But in fifth position, Laurent Jalabert, the winner of Flèche Wallon just a few days ago. Well, again, Paul, like, uh, like the Flèche Wallon, the Belgians don't have a great deal of success in recent years in the Age Baston Liège. And the last winner here was Dirk de Wolf, and that was something of a surprise back in 1992. It was a great surprise. Nobody expected that at all. He really did put the pressure on for that one big occasion, having finished second in the World Championships just the year before. That was Angelo Lecchi of the MG Technogym team, and now you can see the yellow jerseys of Onsi trying to queue up behind the world champion Johan Musea, and surely soon Laurent Jalabert must make his move because we're starting to get to the very steep slopes of the Côte de Laraduc. Moving up there on the outside, one of the GAN riders, 
Chris Boardman is riding the event today and it, one of the first major rendezvous of his this year is to try and do something at least in this event. This in fact is Zula who's going to be the first to go for Onse. Well Alex Zula, a tall man he may be but he can climb very very well indeed. He's attacked very early on here on the Cote de Forge. Now maybe Jalabur has said you give it a go first and see how the race reacts because they work one on one those two riders. They're so strong Ranked one and two in the world, the Jalabert is down there and doing nothing, but now there is a reaction coming. Well, it's one of the Mercatoni Uno riders deciding to go, and you see Jalabert has moved up into second position there. He's decided that he's today going to do the work of a teammate. He's already won Flesh Wallon. The last time he came to try and win Liege Baston Liege, in fact, he went out with an attack up about 100 kilometers from the finish on the Cote de Stocker. He thought he could ride away like Eddie Merckx used to do from the rest of the field and he blew himself to pieces. So today, I think, riding a little bit more sensibly, moving up into first position at the head of the main field, really just to control, not to chase down Alex Zuller, but you can see now how narrow this road is with the big crowd that has turned out to watch Liège Baston Liège. Johan Museo starting to struggle a little bit, dropped down to about 10th place. In fact, there's also a tourist race goes here uh, once a year, tourist ride, and the crowd is equally as thick when the touring cyclists go over as well. But now it looks as though they're starting to thin out. The race at last uh, being sparked into life after a rather lacklustre ride down to Baston. And now it's coming back to its rendezvous with Laradute. The riders who scramble across to the lead group here should be assured of a race right down to the finish. Museo a little bit reticent, but even so, is trying to get forward. One or two of the crowd picking out the rainbow jersey of the world champion. And the Museo using other riders to try and get him across. In fact, Evkini Berzin is the rider just in front of him there, but the gap has opened. That's a serious move there, and it was obviously pre-planned -pre by the Onse squad because what's happened is Alex Zula went out first. Laurent Jalabert waited to see what reaction was going to come for the other riders in this break, and he then just leapt across the gap. Now Museo is seeing the danger of having Alex Zula and Laurent Jalabert at the front, and he is trying to close down the gap on the Côte de la Redoute, and I think in second position there, riding for the Francais de Jeu, that's bound to be Mauro Gianetti. This is Michele Bartoli from MG who's got up there, so we've got a four-man leading group at the moment. Bartoli is the rider who's now latched on at the back, but Zula is the man who's determined to keep this going until he's sure everybody who has the strength can stay with him and everybody else has gone out of sight. Laurent Jalabert, alert as ever, waited till his team a leader went clear and then joined him. One can't really say it's team leader, I suppose, because we never know which one is the leader in that team. They're both equally good. The white jersey of Johan Museo putting up a game fight lower down the slopes there, and if he can just hold them reasonably under control, a little bit of uh, risk on the descent, and he could join the leading breakaway. The tough thing about the Côte de la Redoute is not only is it a long, steep climb, but when you do get over the top, there isn't an immediate descent. It goes on in a long, false flat for a, quite a long time. There was at one time, it uh, looked to me as if one of the Batic riders had got into this group, but I think the power and pressure that has been applied by Alex Zuller in the front has just blown him away. Bartoli now surrounded by the Onse riders, Alex Zuller and Laurent Jalabert. Jalabert looking for the big double. It's very rare that that ever does happen. I think one of the most recent victories that was done in Flesh Wallon and Liege Baston Liege was done by Marino Argentine several years ago. Yes, we used to call him a man of the Ardennes classics. Bartoli having a little chat here with the Jalabert. And I'm not too sure what he would say to him there. He was caught in the Onse sandwich. He's decided to go on the outside and have a look in. But in fact, he's going to feel a little bit compromised here. We're looking at the riders who finished third, first, third and fourth in the Flesh Wallon just five days ago. So they know each other's strengths. And Bartley's going to have to work out something special now because if those three do go away and the gap is opening... Uh, then he's going to have a real problem on his hands. Here's the chase group now. I think that's Gabriella Colombo who's trying to lead the rest of the race around that bottom bend. Gianetti also there, third in line. Well, you can see now there's still not a major gap being put across by those riders there. 
Johan Museu did try to get across over the top of Laradou, but you see he just did not have the force. And in fact, there's still no descent. These riders going through the forested part, over the top of the climb here. Bartoli sprinting to stay in the slipstream of Laurent Jalabert, who goes to the front now to accelerate. Still exactly the same position as he had when he was riding Flesh Wallon. He's such a strong rider. The upper part of his torso hardly moving at all. But these three riders, in fact, Museu has decided to try and get across again. He realizes the danger of the breakaway, and he He's leapt out of that chasing group. Well, I don't know whether he's uh, he's become a totally different bike rider this year, inspired by the wearing of the World Championship jersey, which he won so brilliantly and so well judged with a great tactical ride in Switzerland last year in Lugano. Now it's uh, going to be left to the World Champion to try and do what he can for himself. This is a gently undulating road here through the woods, uh, rises as well as falls away, and then it plunges down uh, towards the Côte des Forges. There's the little left turn. He's not very far away, is he, Museo? He could get across here. Now, Bartoli, he's had uh, um, a third place two years ago in this event, and it's worth noting, I suppose, uh, that in that year, Laurent Jalabert was the winner. And uh, now I wonder what will happen this time around. Certainly got to make it before they get to the end of this narrow section of road because when they do get to the end of this section, they turn to the right, then they're on the very big main road which takes them then towards Liège. One more major climb for them to, to negotiate, that of the Côte de Forge. It's not a, a tough climb like the Côte de Laraduc, more of a gradual ascent, but that in fact is where the, uh, the Dutchman Stephen uh, Rooks managed to get away from Roach a few years ago. There's the right-hand turn onto the main road now. Now he'll have time chance to assess just how far in front those leading three riders, and I would make that round about only six or seven seconds, so he's got a good chance of nailing it down. Well, he's closing in all the time. This is a world-class chase here by Museo. He waited long enough to see if anybody else would carry him up there. They couldn't, so he's taken the chance to go alone. If he contacts these three leaders, then there might be a rethink of tactics by everybody because Museo has a very good finish. The only disadvantage, as far as Johan is concerned, is the uphill finish, uh, which has become the popular finish of Liège-Bastogne-Liège, just outside the big city itself, on a little climb down in the back streets in the town of On. Well, Museo this week wearing number 11. And amazing that the, 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 the amount of bad luck that he's had so far this year. He's ridden every one of the World Cups magnificently. He crashed at the finish of Milan San Remo. He was in the leading group in the Tour of Flanders when, in fact, somebody fell onto his back wheel. And then in Paris-Roubaix, he was in every move that counted, and every time he came up with a flat tie. He really has been dogged by bad luck, which makes me wonder if there really is a curse attached to the, the rainbow jersey. Today, a victory would help, I think, to bring his morale back a little bit ever present in the World Cup for the last few years now. He's either won it or he's finished second in the last four years of World Cup cycling, Johan Museu. Now, this is the long descent here. Our cameras don't give you the best angle, but in fact, it's quite a steep descent through the town. Twists and turns. A chance for Michele Bartoli, who doesn't seem afraid to do work, despite the fact that he has two teammates here. I would have thought, Paul, he might have more sense to just sit behind them and say, well, you're both on the same team. Get on with it. Well, I think he's happy with the situation at the moment. He realises they've got away from a very big group because, let's not forget, going to the bottom of the Côte de la Redoute, there was a major peloton, which we don't normally see. Normally, at this stage of the race, if the weather has been bad, you'd be down to a group of about 40 or 50. Today, it looked as if there were 70 or 80 riders at la Redoute there. So I think what Bartoli's worried about at the moment is riders coming back from behind. So he's going to work with the two on-sea riders and worry about the consequences later. Well, later is not so far away now, but uh, quite clearly he's prepared to give it a lot of effort here. Mikela Bartoli, who turned pro back in 1992 and has slowly developed until last year he had his best ever season. Nine victories, including the Tour de Flanders, and uh, finishing 19th in the Tour de France, 8th in the Olympic Games, and 5th in the British World Cup event at Leeds. And so you see, and 3rd, of course, in the World Championships, we must forget that. He's a rider who is really developing. Here's our Belgian cameraman just reminding us that they have the world champion and they've gone back to him. And this is the view you get uh, through the sweat and tears of the world champion who can see the three leaders, but he's now having a little bit of difficulty crossing the gap to them. This is a slight rise. It's quite a hard little climb, this one. And it takes you just up to the top of the house line there. And then they're back on the descent again. 
We'll just see how difficult it is, but bear in mind, even though Johan Museo is the world champion, we have three of the top riders in the world here working very well together. Two of them excellent climbers, Laurence Jalabert and Alex Zula. So I think, you know, Museo is going to have a hard job. I would have expected him if he was going to make contact to have done it at the bottom of the descent. Now it's going to be very difficult indeed. In fact, he's starting, Phil, to look a little bit laboured. He's rocking his shoulders, not the, the power of a man in full control of the situation at the moment. He's out of the saddle trying to find some sort of rhythm and I think he's realized now he's not going to make contact with that leading group of three. I just felt on that little rise it was the moment when he suddenly said to himself I'm in trouble here and now he's not as fluid and when a rider starts looking back like that it's a sure sign he needs a little bit of help and so it may have been wise of Bartley to share the pace with these two riders and keep them away from the grips of Johan Museu and very shortly, Bartley's going to have to say to himself, I have a slight problem here with number one and number two in the world rankings and me. Bartley himself, though, Paul, is now up to fourth overall in the world rankings, so he too has become a star in his own right. Well, his team manager, Giancarlo Ferretti, really does believe that he's one of the top riders in the world, and the way that he won the Tour of Flanders last year was absolutely magnificent, and I think... Winning an event like that really does change you. Wearing the rainbow jersey, as Johan Museo does as well, changes a man's nature. And he really has ridden dominantly this year. A lot more confidence than he had last year, Museo. But at a stage like this, after a very heavy classics campaign, it is difficult to go out and produce it every weekend on the run. Now three leaders and still working hard together. Barthley not afraid to go through despite the known quality of those other two men. Here's the face of the world champion, Johan Museu, who's obviously felt the chill air this morning with his long sleeve jersey on, but now he's starting to roll up his sleeves and try and catch up. He's still turning over a heavy gear here as he's gone over the top of that climb now. But I think he's looking back for a little bit of help, and it may well, may well be he's seen it coming here. Now, we haven't been further back than Museu since we came over the top of the Laradute, but as far as we know, there are chasers, and they're not very far behind, and it's not a very big group. If Museo has spotted it, he might feel that he should wait for them and see what he can produce later. Well, he's obviously looking back for reinforcements. He's given up any hope, I think, now of catching the three on his own. He will wait and see what the situation is behind that could be developing and hope that he can find some allies to try and organise a chase and bring back these three leaders. But Michele Bartoli has had um, an ex excellent start to the season so far, winning one of the toughest stages of the Tour of the Mediterranean to the top of the Mont Ferrand and he was looking to perform well in Tirreno Adriatico and then carry on to a good classic performance. But you know, he wasn't the rider in Tour of Flanders this year that he was last year when he walked away with a magnificent victory. But at the moment, he's in a very difficult, precarious situation because he's surrounded by two once riders, ranked number one and two in the world. So he's working with them consistently, but in the back of the mind, he must be wondering what he's going to do when these two riders start to attack him one after the other. And he knows they will, because that's the way to treat them. One will go, and if he answers that attack, the other one will go until they finally wear him down. That will be their plan. We'll see if it works or not, and it won't be very long before we get the answer to that. Now, there is a group of about 16 riders. In fact, here they are, and they've just picked up Johan Museu, and this is a very, very powerful group, and they don't look to me like riders who are sitting in the back seat. They are driving this group along. That's why Museo waited. There was no point in banging your head against the wind here. So he may as well go back and join in the chase and see what can be got from it right now. And that's uh, Massaglia, Gabriella Massaglia at the front. One small win, his first ever pro win of his career under his belt this year. And now feeling very confident indeed. Third year professional. And he's got the whole of the Mappe team are doing a bit of work at the front here. We've got Lanfranchi and number 13. Well, that'll be Gianni Farazin. Well, a completely different Mappe GB team to the team we've seen over the last 15 days. That's the power, I think, which has made them the number one team in the world. The fact that they can have a representative team in any different kind of race that they go to. In the one-day classics and the cobbles in France, Belgium and northern France, like Paris-Roubaix, they've got men like Ludo uh, Wilfred Peters that they can count on. When they come here to the Hillier classics, they can then look towards their stronger Italian contingent. And that, I think, is why Johan Museo decided once he hadn't got across, he would sit up because he knew there would be a heavy contingent of Mappe GB riders in that chase group. And now what they have to do is organise the chase and pull back these three leaders. Now, with so many Mappe GB riders, I think in that group, Phil, it's going to be very difficult for them to stay clear. 
and all willing to work, of course, to pull the big Johan back into the thick of the action. That's why he was waiting. He's got what he wanted. Now we're heading up towards the Côte de Forge, and that is surely where the Onse boys will start to try and soften up Mikola Bartoli. Alex Zula, and the rider in this breakaway who turned professional back in 1991, at the end of that season, actually, uh, just after he waved farewell to the amateur ranks with a great win in the Grand Prix William Tell which is a stage race, the, probably the best stage race for the amateurs in Switzerland. There's the huge crowd here as we're on the lower slopes now of the Côte des Forges. And this is the chase and the Mappe boys are going to do all of it now. The Rabo Banker here, which indicates that Rolf Sorensen must be down the line there somewhere. In fact, there's a lot more than 16 riders here, Paul. Looks to be about 25 or 30 of them. And Sorensen should certainly be in there as well. In fact, and they've now started a very fast piece of tempo riding here. They've strung this long line of riders out as far as the eye can see. They are starting to move very quickly indeed. A lot of power there coming, I think, from Mape GB and Rabobank. They want to pull it all back together. Let's not forget the leader of the World Cup at the moment is Rolf Sorensen after his win in the Tour of Flanders. He's riding as well as a change man because I've never seen him perform so well as he rode last weekend in Paris-Roubaix and this weekend again looking to stay up there in the overall standings. He's got his team's morale changed as well too because Rabobank from being a team that would sit back and just wait for the sprint and now playing a dominant controlling role in these World Cup races. Quite agree. I think this is going to turn out to be the best team that Jan Ross has managed. And he's managed some great teams over the years. The former world champion, a uh, rider who won many stages of the Tour de France when he became a team manager. He always managed to bring some very, very powerful sponsors into the sport. But I think this year, the Rabobank team is going to turn out to be the best one he's put together. We'll, we'll find out. He's had uh, the Dane Sorensen win the Tour de Flanders, lead the World Cup. And things are looking OK at the moment for Sorensen because he's right up. He's going to score points if things work out for him today. As we look down the long line of riders. That's Eric Brooking there from the Rabobank, another great rider in his time. He's been a superb challenger at races like the Tour de France. And Eric, I think today, could be looking for a high finish in liege baston liege But the gap that these riders have is still hovering around the 30-second mark. They haven't opened up as much as they need to. As at the front, this is the man, the master man, Giancarlo Ferretti, the team manager of MG Technogym. He'll be explaining the situation, trying to decide a strategy here for Michele Bartoli, one man alone up against two of the strongest riders in the world. Well, Ferretti knows all about celebrations with the winners at the end of Liège, Baston Liège, because he had it last year with Pascal Richard, and he's had it before that with Moreno Argentin, and so he'll be feeling pretty confident, I would think. Just me, might be a slight concern about the two yellow boys with him. Well, I wouldn't be very confident at all if I was in a breakaway with Laurent Jalabert and Alex Zuller because Jalabert has certainly got the fastest sprint of these three riders and I don't see a man like Michele Bartoli getting away from them, so it must certainly go down to the sprint. And in fact, I would think they would try and operate an attack from Alex Zuller because that way then Jalabert could control Michele Bartoli in this group and try and split it apart. But then... There's a long way to go. They're over the top now of the Côte de Forge. They're now looking for a descent that will take them down into the outskirts of Liège and then the final climb up to the finish just in the little suburb of N. Well, they climbed it quickly. A little bit surprised there was no attack coming, but it didn't come at all. This is the same can be said by this group behind, which is all working very hard. Coppolillo is up here and number 46 is Lecce. But they haven't. Uh, these are trying to slow down the chase, of course, while at the front the Rabobank is trying to uh, lift it up a little bit. I must say I'm glad to see Eric Broiking coming back onto what seems like good form this year. I thought last year he was reaching the end of a great career, but no, he started to get back into the action again. And there's Pat Jonker, the Australian on the Rabobank team, but he isn't an Australian this year. He's taken out a Dutch racing licence because, uh, they're being a Dutch team, they want to try and get some a little bit more publicity out of him in Holland. Well, the world of international yeah. cycling really has Confusing, changed a lot. You have to change your nationality to get into a different team these days. A little climb that didn't used to be in Liège-Baston-Liège. This is because the finish has changed to the suburb of N. This is a road that cuts across from the old main road down into Liège to the other little suburb. A tough climb as well. This is a place where if somebody's feeling strong, then they could launch a nice little attack, only about a kilometre long. They go up here and start to get into the forest and then turn right back on themselves. This is where Laurent Madouas jumped away from the main field last year to go on to take fourth place. And what a great result it was for Motorola last year. They won the team prize on the day. 
and uh, the man who got second place in which he was disappointed beaten in the sprint by Pascal Richard probably one of the craftiest riders in the game but sadly for Lance Armstrong it put him into second place that wasn't a bad defence considering he'd won the event the year previously. Well there's the attack from Jalabert, he knows the finish here, he's been out, most of these riders have stayed here for several days at a hotel at the bottom of the climb and he realised now was the time to go, just a little climb and Alex Zuller has dropped off the back there so he hasn't managed to get rid of Bartel, he's actually got rid of his own teammate and wily move by Jalabert who now sits up I think he'll wait and in fact Bartel has gone straight over the top. Brilliant riding, brilliant riding, I don't think that quite worked out according to the plan of Jalabert, he cracked his own teammate but Barthley went with him, he noted that his teammate Azula had been cracked so didn't allow Jalabert to, to slow down and recover and allow the return of Zula. he hit him straight away and he's forced the reaction from Jalabert has had to go back up to Barthley now I think Lawrence Jalabert be kicking himself a little bit there now he looked over his shoulder to see if Zula was coming back and I don't think he is, I can't be sure, but now we're down to two and it's one on one and the telecom are also getting a little excited now back in the main field Looks like Udo Boltz, one of the German riders on the telecom squad, he's trying to leap out there. They know this final little ramp is a chance to move away and get a high position in liege bastogne liege but I have to admit, I think that attack there by the Onse riders really backfired on them, and, and it was Michele Bartoli who took the upper hand. This is Udo Boltz, he's trying to get clear of the leading group, an excellent rider, he hasn't had any victory so far this year, but he's a man that when it comes down to the Tour de France is going to be a superb ally and lieutenant for Bjarne Ries. Well, again, Bolt's a vastly underrated rider. He had a fine ninth place in the Tour de France again a couple of years ago and uh, often comes up with some excellent performances. Bartoli now, he's uh, not going to get any help from Laurent Jalabert because I think they were both very much surprised by the violence of his return and his counter-attack there. Jalabert sitting in second position is hoping that Bartoli will slow down a little bit and allow Alex Zuller to come back, which is exactly what has happened. They're almost at the top of the climb here, so I don't think they will attack once more. They'll wait now, surely, work together over the top of this climb and then fight it out on the final ascent up to N. Well, Big Alex comes smartly back, but Bartoli knows something now. He knows that Alex Zuller is not going as well as he might appear. And so we'll wait and see. Now, looks like a little glimpse of Claudio Chiapucci there, sitting on the back wheel of Udo Bolt. So he's brought Bolt's back, I think, into the fold. Or has he got to him by himself? He may have got to him by himself at the moment. And that's a good move by Claudio Chiapucci, showing Paul, I feel, a little bit of his old brilliance this year. Certainly a return to form for Kier Putin, I think coming right on form for the Tour of Italy. But again, in fact, it's Bartoli now who's decided to come to the top of this climb that he'll have another little attack, but he's not going to get any help now from Laurent Jalabert. Jalabert wants to keep the force of numbers on his side. He doesn't want to have Alex Zuller drop, so he'll let Bartoli attack. He'll stay in his wheel and hopefully on the descent over the top of this climb, his teammate Alex Zuller will come back and the three of them will stay together till the finish. Zuller, you can see, having an awfully hard time a moment ago, it looked as if all of the, the, the advantage was going to be on the Onse side, but now Bartoli beginning to put things more towards his own, his own possibilities. Well, Bartoli third in uh, 1995. That was the year that uh, Mauro Gianetti uh, won the event. And Gianetti in the back group, or not the back group, but the next group on the road at the moment. Udo Boltz, I think the rider is saying, well, you've shown yourself to be quite strong, so you better stay at the front where we can keep an eye on you there in the chase. Barthel now having a little bit of a word here uh, with Jalabert. I'm not sure whether he'll understand what he said because Jalabert speaks fluent Spanish as well as French, but even so. Well, there is an international language in the world of professional cycling. You can always make yourself be understood, whether it be in a little bit of Italian, a little bit of Spanish, or a little bit of French. Even English is being used quite a lot now. Bartley won't be too happy about the fact that these two riders from the same team are not working with him and he's going to try and do everything to encourage them to do so but I think now they're seeing that he's actually quite a strong rider today he's in good form and he's going up there accelerating not really an attack just a, an acceleration to keep the speed high he's got no choice really this is the disadvantage and uh, if he did happen to win this race well he, he would have been immensely strong because I mean Again, you see, Bartley's just pushed the pace. He went back, wanted to go back to wheel number three, and that wasn't to be, and so the attack comes once more. Now, we expected an attack to come here from Zuller because it's a sort of 
a death throw attack, I would think. And if Bartley doesn't react, then the weakest man in the, in the group would go on to win the race. So Bartley has got to react. As Jalabert will sit there and watch and do absolutely nothing. And no matter how long it takes Michele Bartley to claw his way across the gap, then he'll just have to get on with it. And then when he gets there, we can expect Jalabert to go again. Well, in the, the, the language of professional cycling, I would say that attack by Alex Zulli was really quite a damp firecracker because it really didn't go the way I was expecting. In fact, Jalabert now is trying to jump across. These guys are trying every little tactic they have in the book. He sent Alex Zulli away there. Now he's decided to go, but you see Bartoli is frying today. He really knows that these two riders have got to attack him one at a time, but they mustn't play this game for too long because let's not forget the main field are only about 30 or 40 seconds behind. So if they keep doing this, this will allow the main field to slowly eat away at their advantage. The best thing they can do is say, well, let's forget about this kind of attacking for the moment. Let's work together and we'll sort it out when we get a little bit closer to the finish. But what superb bike riding this is. You know, we've had some great classic races this year and we must uh, remind ourselves at this point that there have been no victories yet by Italian riders, unheard of for at least six years. And uh, Bartoli in the kill again now, but with the odds stacked against him, with the two Onse candlesticks just sitting on his shoulder there and giving him a real rough ride towards the finish. And that will cause him a little bit of frustration and could make him create a slight error in his decision here because the reason they're attacking like this is to put him under pressure all the time and hopefully wear him down but it could also frustrate him because he'll, he'll get the feeling that he's being isolated he's the man that has to chase every time one or other of them attacks but he knows the strongest man is going to be Laurent Jalabert but he can't allow any movement by Alex Zuller. And moving back to the other group here we've got Pantone he's back in the group again and it's good to see he's finding his form. Fifth in Flesh Wallon and the world champion Johan Museo. And I think that was Viet Zieberg again on the far side from Mercatoni Uno. But look at the difference in riding styles. He's a big man, the Johan Museo. And you have the slightly built Pantani dancing around on the pedals in the pack. He won't be feeling the hill probably quite as bad as Johan Museo here. Well, Museo is strong, but I don't think he's in super form this afternoon here. He's trying to open up a gap but it's not really an attack. He's using a little bit of power that he's got left, but it's not a super Johan Museo today. He hasn't managed to get across to that leading group of three riders. He got so close, he was only six or seven seconds away. He could almost reach out and touch them, but he couldn't close down the last few lengths. And it's turning out to have been the winning move too, although the gap there, as Museo led over that chase group, is around about 35 seconds. It's not a lot, but the finish is not very far away either. Bartoli now going to the front, setting the pace. All he's going to do now is try and encourage these two Onse riders to work with him. In fact, they have now decided, they've probably had word from Manolo Sainz in the Onse team car that the best thing now is you haven't managed to get rid of Bartoli, so work it all out, try and keep it together, because Jalabert, if it does come down to the sprint, don't forget, you're the fastest man here. And now we get a first good look to find there are still a lot of riders left in this chase group. As our cameraman there just tries to change position on the bike, so we've got back to the leaders. And uh, the two Onse boys have delivered just about everything they know in racing two against one, and they still haven't managed to get rid of this man, Michele Bartoli, who is riding with a little bit of inspiration, I think, today, because uh, they haven't uh, moved him an inch. He's been alert, he's expected the attacks, he's read them just before they've happened, and he's answered them with all of his strength. Jalabert must be worried now because he knows that Zula can't have a lot left either. Well, they're circumnavigating Liège now. They've taken that turning to the left. The climb we saw, all the attacks there, has brought them across onto a different approach into the city of Liège. They'll drop down alongside the Meurs, flick across it, and then begin the final climb up to the town or the suburb of Aisne. And it's a very difficult climb indeed, a very bad road, lots of small cobblestones, bumpy road and a tough finish after a race of 262 kilometres. And it was on this climb where Tony Rominger once had a flat tyre when he was in, or he thought he was in, for the final kill uh, with Lance Armstrong. Now time for a stretch. And uh, Jalabert there, I think he's OK, but uh, he's not quite the man he was in Flesh Wallon. Remember that great ride with Luc Leblanc and he danced up to victory on the Mueur de Huy? Well, Bartoli was best of the rest, in effect. Well, he was just behind Alex Zuller in fourth place. Now he's taking them both on again. Well, Phil, there's a very subtle difference 
between this race and Flesh Wallon. It's a subtle difference of 62 kilometers, <laughs> which is an extra one and a half hours in the saddle. Well, that's quite a subtle difference, I must confess. And this, don't forget, the 83rd Paris, uh, not Paris Bay, but Liège, Baston Liège. And now it's time for a little relaxation there as Jalaba uh, starts to rethink his strategy. But these riders, don't forget, are dicing at the front with only just on 30 seconds advantage over the chasers. Interesting to see Jalabert there. That would indicate to me that he's having a little problem yes. with his thigh. It could be the beginnings of cramp. He's trying to stretch it to make sure that it doesn't come on, which is surprising at this stage of the game because normally riders cramp in the hotter part of the season. It's certainly not a hot day today with small snow flurries in the early part of the event, but now the, sc the skies certainly have brightened up, but it's definitely not what I would call a summer day. Well, we have had uh, days a lot worse for the age based on the age in the year that Bernard Eno won. Um, there was snow and it, there was only a handful of finishes. Well, there's the city, all ready and welcome, showing us its best face as we're about to race through Liège and up the mountain or the hill over the back of Liège into the finish. And this, uh, since 1896, the oldest classic. It's not actually the oldest classic, it's the oldest professionally raced classic. Um, in fact, Paris Rouen is the oldest classic, but that's a small amateur race these days. And I'm not even sure it's still held, to be quite honest. But I think it is. I'm fairly sure that it is, Phil, but when we go to the start of the Tour de France in Rouen a bit later in the year, that's one of the things I'll be sure to check up on. Now, here we are then. Let's go on to the bridge now with the chasers. Rolf Sorensen, still very much a part of the chase group. Winner of the Tour de Flanders, leader of the World Cup. And uh, he's soloing, it appears, over the bridge. But in fact, the riders all around him. It's just that there's big gaps between the wheels. He's flicked his left elbow there, wants a bit of help. And uh, you need to slow down, Rolf, to let the rider go past. This looks like it might be Francesco uh, Casagrande from Saico, who's coming through now. Once over this bridge, they too will start to climb up towards the finish. And here's the three leaders on the lower slopes of it here. And gets a bit steeper than this. And still Bartoli. He must be extremely confident, Paul, because he's quite content to work with these two riders. Certainly, but he must realise that very shortly the attacks are going to come again on the final slope up here to the finish line from the two Onsi riders. They've ridden together so well in races like the Tour of Spain in all of the major classics, the Tour de France. They're exceptionally good tacticians, so they will certainly have something at least up their sleeve to try and outwit Michele Bartoli. But the gap now, Phil, is starting to come down. It's around about 20 seconds, so they can't mess around too much. No, well, very shortly they're going to see the three leaders, the group behind. It's still a pretty large group that's coming through. I must say, I've got to admire Alex Zula because he is suffering very, very badly and has been for at least 20 kilometres now, yet he is still prepared to race at the front. And that's a note for all the young cyclists to see uh, just how these top professional riders, even when you think to them it's easy, it most certainly is not. Now, let's get back. This is Gianetti going through now, followed by Sorensen. And uh, on the other side, we've got one of the riders from Scrimio. I think it's Coppolillo, is it? David Castellotto. Well, he's had a great season in the Classics. Well, he's fifth in the Tour of Flanders, then fifth in Paris-Roubaix. So he certainly is the revelation, I think, of this year's early spring campaign. Looking a little bit nervous now, these riders, the three of them. Bartoli there will be waiting for some kind of reaction from the Onse riders, which is sure to come. And it's going to be a very tense moment for him waiting for the first attack and I'm sure it has to come from Jalabert because Zula has put a lot of work into the success of this three-man break over the last 10 or so kilometers and Zula I think starting to drop away now we're on the steeper part of the climb Zula has done his job and it's going to be down to two men a much better chance for Bartoli he's seen that he's seen the fact that Alex Zula has gone accelerated a little bit to reduce the odds now it's one against one for the second time in the last 30 minutes. Zula this time surely is not going to come back because there's not much uh, over the top. And uh, I did mention uh, Gianetti there on the Francais de Jeu team, but in fact I think it was Max Chiandri who was getting into the decisive chase down. We'll find out shortly as we look down now on the two leaders here. We've left uh, Alex Zula in the slipstream. Remember that Alex was third in Flesh Wallon. He's going to have to really go some now to hold on to third in Liège Baston Liège. Well, the yellow team car of the neutral service, Mavic, there dropping in, which means the team managers of these two riders have been told to stop at the side of the road. The gap coming down very dramatically, down to 15 seconds now, I think. Alex Zuller certainly dropping out of the picture completely 
and this you can see in fact is Maximilian Chiandri and he's in a small group that have managed to get away from the, that leading group of riders. Alex Zula nowhere to be seen, the yellow car of the neutral service vehicle just a little bit further up the road, that is Casarotto, there's Casagrande and Rolf Sorensen now, what a remarkable season he's had in the spring so far. Well, fantastic riding by Rolf here, but again, he wants to do some work, but not all of it, and he wants a little bit of help. Uh, these two riders are just about surviving this breakaway, as once again, the top pros in the game are trying to bring this to a perfect end and catch them just before the line. Laurence Jalabert now has no advantage over Mikola Bartoli. In fact, to the contrary, I think he's rather concerned by the way this man has rode today. He has been quite brilliant in his attacks and answers to attacks, and he's still not afraid to go through and work with Laurence Jalabert, who won Flesh on just five days ago. They're now over the top of the climb. Soon they will see the one kilometer to go banner, and really, you can't pick a winner from them now. As we go back to the chase here, We've still got uh, Casarotto, Casagrande, and also Sorensen always cajoling others to do the work. He's got Max Chandri to go through now. They're the four chasers. I think, I think they have actually passed Alex Zula, and we haven't seen it because there's hardly a gap between them now. Well, the car that they can see in the distance, I'm sure, is that yellow car of the Mavic neutral service vehicle there. So these two riders, looking over their shoulders, they'll realize that the team managers are no longer there, which will indicate to them that the gap is coming down rapidly. Both looking over their shoulders, nervousness. This is the time when you can start to make mistakes, when you think, I've been at the head of affairs for 30 kilometers. If I just slow down now, I'm going to lose the race, which is when the cooler, calmer man can play the great game of poker and force the other one into making a mistake. Bartoli looking a little bit more nervous than Jalabert. He's looked back more recently than, in fact, Jalabert did, the Frenchman, because I'm sure they can feel these riders. And there is Alex Zula. In fact, they haven't picked him oh. up yet. So Zula just in front of this leading group, the chasing group of four. Well, they're going to use Zula as a stepping stone or a carrot now to try and finally ride this off. Zula still hanging on to third place and may well get the same position he claimed just a few days ago in the uh, Flesh Wallon. But, you know, as far as the Ardennes weekend goes, it's going to be victory to Laurent Jalabert if it stays this way because whether he finishes first or second, he'll marry that up with his win in Flesh Wallon. If Bartoli wins, he finished fourth in Flesh Wallon. So Jalabert will get it. And I think he's just said to Bartoli, look, they're coming. What are you going to do about it? And here they are, and there is Zola. Zola has been caught, and look at the way the riders go far to the right. They're not going to give Big Alex the slightest chance of getting on a back wheel here. As Casarotto goes through, followed by Sorensen, Casagrande and Chiandri. They're the four riders, and, uh, well, I suppose that's what professional racing is all about, Paul. They didn't give Alex a chance. Well, he's the professional now, Laurence Jalabert, number 21. He's really playing it cold, just like Jan Ras used to do in the old days of the TI Rally squad. He says, it doesn't matter. I won flesh well on the other day. You're the strongest. You want to win. You take me to the finish line if you can do. This is a most interesting race today, and Bartoli is so far up to everything. There is the kite in the sky, 1,000 metres to the finish, and Bartoli is inspired by that, and he's going to put in an early attack here. Now he's got a little gap on Jalabert. I wonder if Jalabert's legs have finally gone today because this attack is opening up. He's gone 1,000 metres from the line. Now, what a turn up for the book. Last year, Michele Bartoli shocked the Belgians when he came and he won the Tour of Flanders. Now, on a brilliant, brilliant, inspired day in the age, he has done it again in Belgium. He is riding to a classic victory, the 83rd Liège Bast on the age. And boy, does he deserve this today. Well, that's remarkable. I didn't think he would be able just to ride off a man like Laurent Jalabert there. He didn't even attack. He took the speed up slowly, up to maximum speed. He looked round once to see where Jalabert was. He saw Jalabert couldn't even stay in the slipstream. He's gone an awful long way out. He has about 150 metres to go now before he takes the left-hand turn into the finish straight. But with a gap like that, he's sure, surely going to walk away with victory in Liège. Baston Liège is concerted now. He knows he has to just keep the power on. He knows exactly what the finish line is like. These riders stay in Liège for about a week or so. Soon he's going to take the corner. He knows now that the victory is in the bag as long as there's no return of the group from behind. Behind. And he's also vindicated the Italian nation. At last they've got a victory in a World Cup race this year. Fifth in Milan San Remo for Bartoli, fourth in the Flesh Wallon. Now he gets the magic number one spot in the age bast on the age. Round the left hand bend. He'll now see the finishing line. It's amazing, but Laurent Jalabert in the end appeared to have been beaten rather easily. Jalabert must have known one more attack by Bartoli and he was done for. 
and he surrendered at exactly the kilometre board. Barth, he looks over his shoulder, salutes the cameraman who's right alongside him. There's one for us as well. He's got the victory. And you know what the Italians say, this man may well yet be one of the new emerging talents from that country. He's now uh, 24 years of age, he's almost 27 actually as he crosses the line. Jalabert comes home about 20 seconds later for, no, 8 seconds, 9 seconds later for Jalabert. Then uh, this is Colombo, don't know where he came from, we never saw him. He's there ahead of Luc Leblanc. And then comes the pack and just hanging on in there is Max Chandry. He gets in as well, Johan Museo on his shoulder. And the yellow colours there of Biet Zberg and Marco Pantani. They came in together, they'd be around 7th and 8th or ninth position for them. But this is the man who got the position they all wanted, number one. It was never, never a sure thing, was it? That breakaway coming on Laradut. And then he found he was totally outnumbered and he allowed them to throw everything at him. He wrote them all off one by one in the end. I'm not surprised he's smiling now. You've got to be very happy after winning a race like Liège, Bastogne, Liège. Phil, the commentator asked him about the tactical race he rode today. Well, today I had absolutely fantastic legs. And this morning I really felt that I had a good chance looking at this race. I'm sorry, so I don't speak very good French. With Ferretti in the team car, is he a very good strategist for you? He knows the race well. Ferretti told me I had to ride with the riders and then attack with just, with just one kilometer to go. That was good for me. And the commentator there uh, thanking uh, Bartley. He doesn't speak very good French, but he made a big effort there, but not as big as the effort he made to win Liège, Baston Liège today. A great victory for Bartley. And again, I think we've witnessed another star really in the making. So the Liège, Baston Liège, like all of the classics this year, has been a hard fought event and has given us yet another different winner. There's been no consistency in the races this year, and for me, that's always a good sign that we are going to be continuing a great season this year. This is how he did it. He cracked Laurent Jalabert, and we were all surprised at that. 1,000 metres from the finish, and then it was all him right down to the line. He had lots of time in hand, about eight seconds, in fact, over Jalabert to salute the crowd and enjoy what arguably is the finest victory of his career. So remember the name, Amico Bartoli, the first man from Italy to win a World Cup race this year. And that victory giving him the overall lead in the World Cup and pushing Rolf Sorensen down into second place. This has been another good classic. Here's the result then, a win for Bartoli in 7 hours 9.45. Laurent Jalabert second, Gabriella Colombo coming in for third. Luc Leblanc continuing his fine form from Flesh Boulon gets fourth. And Max Chiandri gets fifth, the world champion Johan Museo sixth. An 18th place and a few World Cup points there for Rolf Sorensen, who lost his lead in that championship today. I hope you've enjoyed the coverage. I'm Paul Sherwin, I'm Phil Liggett saying goodbye.